Uh, we have a full day of uh, event today, despite the uh, limitation the, um, uh, present. So please, uh, uh, all participants, um, close your videos. Um, and I will give you the instructions uh, on how the day will be uh, organized. Can the second slide be short, please? Uh, who is moving my slide? Okay. Um, so the agenda for today is uh, we started with a keynote from Thorsten Herbden, he's Director General for Energy Policy from the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. Uh, this will be followed up by a keynote by the CEO of 50 Earth, uh, Stefan Kapfara. Uh, and we will have a spotlight with TSOs from across Europe. Uh, there will be a possibility for asking questions, uh, both from the panelists themselves, but also from the audience. And I will tell you in a moment how this is going to work. Um, there are three respondents to the uh, initial panel um, that will provide uh, uh, opinion from across Europe and across society. Uh, we will introduce then the afternoon session and after a three hours break, we will reconvene with working groups. Please, next slide. Um, so that uh, uh, we can dive in into a number of topics uh, to understand what the key messages and key positions that are highlighted in the morning can be reflected in the daily work. Uh, the working group will uh, um, then reconvene uh, in, uh, in the plenary, provide some recommendations uh, to Caterina Sicomani uh, that she will reflect this from the side of the commission. Um, this will be followed by a, a signing of the request to adapt European energy planning. And finally, we conclude with some closing remarks from Deputy Minister Joao Galamba from the um, Secretary, is Secretary of State in Portugal. Um, next slide, please. So, um, who is RGI? Um, RGI is still, after 11 years, a unique cooperation between industry and civil society. You see here that uh, um, we have members in most of what we call all Europe, and we are very keen to expand further. Um, the TSOs and NGOs are coming together to find solutions on how to uh, deliver the energy transition respecting nature and people. Um, we will be happy to share information with you bilaterally. Um, why are we having a workshop? A um, few days ago, we um, published a statement uh, on the 60% uh, emission reduction target that has been uh, um, um, agreed in the European Parliament. And so we want to discuss how can we accelerate the uh, transition to a largely um, renewable based system, but also a transition to net zero as quickly as possible so that we can combat climate change. Um, next slide, please. So we want to bring uh, all these different speakers together and challenge each other to come up with the best possible ideas on how can we uh, indeed facilitate. Uh, despite this um, um, virtual uh, system that we are using today, due to the health restriction, uh, we have uh, a, a possibility to uh, embed and address your questions. Um, we use um, pool everywhere. Uh, on these slides, you see the link uh, that you can register. Ideally, you open this link on a different device 
There you can pose your question, you can rank the questions of other participants, uh, and we will extract some of them um, in relation also with the time that we have, uh, so that uh, uh, your voices can be um, heard. Also, we will copy the um, top questions and we will try to address bilaterally in a, um, after the event. Please so stay tuned with us. How does it really look? Pool everywhere. Next slide will uh, is basically a screenshot of what you will be um, faced with. Um, put your name, uh, if you want, put your real name, if not, just put any name. This is uh, easier for us to uh, identify the questions in the list. Um, the questions then you will see in the next screenshot that you will have um, the possibility to enter a question, enter response, but also um, uh, vote for the most interesting questions that you find in the system by uh, using the um, hello up and down. So uh, in the meantime, uh, we will be posting throughout uh, the event on Twitter. And this is the um, Twitter um, name that we will be using for this purpose. Um, before we really start with the keynote of uh, Torsten Herden, we would like to know who is in the room. So please get on uh, pool everywhere and no. Ah, okay, it's a Zoom thing, sorry. Um, just click who you are and we should see um, the result appearing in a minute. Also, Torsten, we will soon be with you. Just bear with us a moment. Is it working? So, please click. We don't know. We are testing these things. Okay, we don't see it, then maybe it will pop up later. We start. Yes, we start. So, Torsten, uh, first of all, thanks so much for joining this event. I know you are super busy and we invited you um, rather late, so it is really great. To, to have you. Uh, Thorsten Herden, as I mentioned before, is the Director General of Energy Policy at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Uh, Thorsten, uh, Germany has the presidency of the council, and so I'm kicked out. Oh, no, okay. Um, the presidency of the council, and we want to hear from you um, to talk about, uh, to paint a picture on where our climate and ambition needs to lie, uh, not just for Germany, but for Europe in general and the world. Um, what is uh, leadership in this moment for you? The floor is yours or the screen is yours. Yeah, Antonella, thank you very much. I don't know whether you can see me. I see a rather curious picture. Uh, can you see me or? I see some melting eyes. I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> this is. I have no idea what that is because uh, beforehand I could see you quite well. Oh, yeah. here you are. We can see you now. Something is coming. Okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, Antonella, thanks a lot. That is, uh, in fact, not, uh, um, well, it, I, I think it, it is melted uh, today because that's uh, some ice uh, from, from skiing uh, <laughs> holidays. But just to make it clear, I, I very often use that uh, when I'm um, discussing in uh, sessions on climate, on energy transition, uh, because we all need to 
uh, know uh, and remind ourselves uh, what the overall target is. And that is very, very simple to save our planet. Uh, I was just doing that in the very beginning of uh, that uh, keynote. Uh, and therefore, it is not only absolute necessary, uh, it is a, a must that we continue our, as you said, uh, leadership, um, the German leadership in uh, climate uh, protection. Also, we have been criticized uh, the last years very much that we are not uh, on track. Um, I think we, we have uh, specifically in this um, um, period of legislation um, put a lot of uh, measures in place uh, in order to, I would say, um, come back to the leadership of, of Germany. Um, and uh, I will very short focus on that. But first of all, thank you very much uh, for that event. And thank you very much that uh, the in-between part of uh, the energy transition, the in-between part of the climate uh, transition, uh, which is uh, infrastructure uh, is uh, doing that event. Because we very, very often um, feel that uh, the discussion is all about uh, production of renewable energy, it is all about consumption of renewable energy, uh, but the missing link in between, how do we become the renewable energy uh, from the production side to the customer uh, is not focused uh, that much. And um, of course, I've seen that uh, Stefan Kapferer will be after me and uh, we, we very often share our ideas. Uh, many of you know that uh, 50 Hertz belongs at least to 20% uh, to the German state. Um, and in that we are very intensively discussing uh, what is the role of future infrastructure. Um, and that for us is also some sort of, um, of the leadership uh, we are continuing to play in the future. I think, uh, again, starting uh, with a very, very clear position uh, is that uh, we are living now in a different world compared to where we have lived in two years ago from the political perspective. Why? Um, it is very simple. We have now put in law climate neutrality by 2050. That is completely different uh, to the time two years ago, because um, two years ago we didn't have that law. And we were always talking about uh, climate reduction by 80 to 95 percent in 2050. And you could imagine that uh, you we had a lot of sectors which uh, defined themselves in the remaining 20%. So uh, whenever we discussed, uh, people told us, well, there is 20% uh, left and I will be in that 20%. That now is gone. So we are living in a complete different political world. We have climate neutrality by 2050 and we have to arrive there, full stop. And now uh, we are in um, the very, very tough discussion on how do we do that? Um, and we have um, also come to a, call it different uh, type of discussion because uh, we are now discussing um, electrons and molecules um, in the same does that mean? Uh, we had a lengthy discussion in the past, um, how can we um, call it electrify the world? Uh, and we all have learned that uh, electrification will uh, continue to grow, no doubt about that. But uh, we will have a lot of applications around the world uh, where electrification is not uh, the solution. Um, and uh, we see that uh, silver bullet, which is not a silver bullet, but uh, this hydrogen hype um, not coming up all over the world, but we see the understanding uh, that decarbonization by 2050 only will work if we use electrons and molecules uh, to arrive at that uh, um, point. And that for us is very, very important uh, because it gives also another aspect uh, into, the, um, into the climate leadership, uh, which means that there is a must uh, for cooperation amongst countries around the world. There is a must uh, because uh, like Germany, we are not at all able uh, to uh, meet our energy demands by producing the energy uh, by our own. No chance whatsoever. This little tiny Germany is not big enough um, to produce the energy we need. So we have ever uh, imported energy. We are importing energy and we will continue to import energy. 
Uh, and that is very important to understand because energy somewhere else in the world, um, also far away, like Chile, like Australia, um, can now be transported um, via certain infrastructure uh, to other places in the world. Um, and it is not oil and gas which we transport in the future. It is wind and it is PV. It is renewable energy which can be put into that molecule of hydrogen or its derivatives uh, and can help uh, other countries which do not have the capacity uh, to produce the energy uh, like we have uh, to decarbonize. And, and that is a very important point and we would like to bring this um, idea even deeper into the uh, mindset of people into the clear mindset of people that uh, everybody has to understand that we put renewables like wind and PV uh, in the middle of our energy um, uh, demand and we can use it from elsewhere in the world uh, by transporting it again elsewhere in the world. And now we are at the very heart of it. How do we do that? So what's the type of infrastructure there? It is not only the question, uh, do we have enough electric grids in Germany to bring wind from the north to the south? No, it would be in the, in the future the question, what type of infrastructure do we need to bring PV or wind from Chile to Germany or to Spain or to France or to whomsoever in, in, in Europe? And that is again the question on infrastructure. What we also have learned, um, I think, all over the world is that uh, we have forgotten um, the infrastructure part too much uh, when we, for instance, in Germany, started with uh, the deployment of renewables. We didn't take care enough uh, to install the necessary infrastructure. Uh, so that is why we are now um, in that uh, problem that we have not enough infrastructure, specifically um, electric infrastructure to bring the wind from north to the south. But uh, if we're now going the also molecule way, so asking ourselves how do we get the renewable molecules or the renewable produced molecules um, to places uh, in the world, then we have to identify the need for infrastructure. We have ident to identify the uh, financial commitments for that infrastructure. And we have to identify the long for industry to invest in that infrastructure in order to make it happen. So we now have it in our hands uh, and that is for, all, for us a very strong role of um, Germany to, to lead to that climate neutrality. We now have it in our hands to plan the production of renewable energy, the infrastructure for transportation of that renewable energy and the usage of that renewable energy, be it in electron format or be it in molecule format and combine it all over the world. And that is also why, uh, for instance, 50 Hertz is very active, not only in Germany, but also in other countries around the world, in order to seek for solutions, for ways to um, bring that type of cooperation amongst countries all around the world together. Because it is not Germany, it is not Europe, it is all over the world that we have to be climate neutral at 2050. And that is what we are working on. And therefore, I'm very happy that uh, the infrastructure part of uh, the whole story, you uh, are going to uh, do that uh, workshop today. And thank you very much for inviting us and, and will be your site and at your disposal if you need us. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dustin. And uh, do you have still time for one question from my side? Sure. sure. So I uh, thanks a lot for this leadership that you are um, telling us about, and we have seen it for sure. Uh, so you stress the fact that electrification is important as well as molecules. Um, do you have any idea on how to optimize these choices? Because today we have more questions than answers. And, uh, um, and how important is this optimization also from uh, um, a geopolitical point of view? Because uh, of course we have uh, interdependencies that we cannot scrap from one day to the other. I think when one very important point of optimization is the simple question, what type of applications, because we always have to look from the application side. So what type of applications 
have no other choices, at least of which we know of today, to decarbonize than using um, um, uh, renewable molecules. That is something what we very much incorporated in our, um, in our hydrogen strategy, where we say, uh, if we look to applications like the steel industry, like the aircraft industry, um, like the big shipping industry, uh, they do not have another choice uh, than just to use uh, molecules, renewable molecules. And if we focus there first, uh, in order to make that application um, um, able to use that uh, molecules, then this is very much one optimization point of view. The other optimization point of view is where do we, uh, that where do we receive these molecules from? And again, what's the type of infrastructure in between? I think we should leave it up to the market to come up with solutions. But if we, in the first uh, turn, organize a, a market uh, turn up, then we have to really focus uh, on, on those applications uh, where we don't see any other possibility. And there are so many in the world, uh, so I don't uh, have any doubts uh, that we can see the molecule way rising up as fast as the electron way has already risen up. Great, Torsten. Um, we thank you very much for your intervention and uh, I'll definitely be in touch with you because I need your help. Um, and uh, now, I, if I can show my next slide, uh, we want to have a spotlight uh, uh, on this uh, leadership across Europe on how can we indeed achieve 100% renewables. 50 words, um, some weeks ago, um, weeks, months ago, announced that uh, uh, they will be 100% renewable by 2032. Uh, this is a great statement. And with this, I would like to introduce uh, Stefan Kapfara, the CEO of 50 Hertz, as well as the panelists that will follow him, Manon van Beck, the CEO of Tenet, Joao Fonsehaus, from REN, the COO, Mark Foley, CEO of Iagrid, and Bernard Goetz, the CEO of Transnet BV, another German um, grid operator. Um, thanks to the health restrictions, it's been possible to have this fantastic um, assembly of uh, speakers. Um, and I'm sorry, you hear the beep, but I cannot uh, uh, remove it. Stefan, the floor is yours. Uh, please um, tell us, how are you going to deliver this 100% uh, renewables in your areas? What are you going to do together with others, together with your colleagues? And uh, we are really uh, um, yeah, interested in your leadership, both uh, in the sector, but in your company. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks Antonella for having me today and I hope everybody can see me. Uh, yeah, I'm also very thankful for being not alone today here in this panel and thanks for your support Manon, Joao, Mark and Werner. I think it's a, a great proof for the cooperation we need in the TSO market in Europe that we need the European energy market to reach the ambitious targets uh, Torsten was talking about. Uh, let me start by explaining a little bit uh, what is the reason why a TSO, which is, uh, everybody knows that, uh, acting in a regulated framework, which is used to a situation that uh, political stakeholders decide about the targets, decide about uh, the next steps, often for us, why is it, uh, from our perspective as 50 Hertz, nevertheless uh, interesting to define an own strategy and to try to accelerate the transition process? Because obviously uh, the pathway is clear for all of us. With the climate neutrality target at the European level, uh, it is uh, very clear that 100% uh, renewable-based electricity supply is uh, coming. Uh, but uh, we can speed up the process and we at 50 Hertz decided to do everything which is allowed for us to try to speed up and to accelerate the transition process. 
And one reason for that is based uh, not only on the climate neutrality target we all know from the European Commission and uh, the European member states, uh, it is linked to another target which is not as well known as the uh, climate neutrality target and not so often discussed, but uh, is on the other side also relevant for the wealth of our nations and uh, public support for the uh, climate neutrality politics of our societies. And that's a target that uh, European Union decided a few years ago that 20% of the GDP in our a European Union should be based on industrial activities. So what we have to deliver as uh, TSOs as well as societies and political stakeholders as NGOs is combining a 20% share of the GDP based on re industrial activities on the one hand and on the other hand uh, a climate neutrality till 2050. Uh, and it was uh, remembered by uh, Thorsten a few minutes ago in his inspiring speech that a few years ago, with only a reduction target of uh, 80 to 95%, we often had a situation that industrial associations were coming to politics and telling politics that uh, the remaining 20 or 15% of greenhouse gas emissions would be uh, given to them for their industrial activities because it is too expensive or too difficult to decarbonize these processes as well. Uh, but we all know and we can feel not only due to the climate neutrality target that this has changed and that's what we can feel in our control area here in eastern Germany. 15 Hertz is responsible for eastern Germany and Hamburg and Berlin, the big uh, two metropolitan areas in Germany. That's what we can feel here. It's no longer a situation that industrial activities are in a defensive mode, that they are interested to tell politics, of course, we are also supporting uh, tackling climate change, but uh, for us, it's too difficult. So give us the right to do it in a fossil way like we did before. No, it's different now. All these energy intensive industries, aluminum, steel industry, chemical industry, are thinking now about high sustainable uh, targets, high sustainable ambitions. Uh, and that's not only based on uh, the uh, political activities, it is also based on uh, facts given by and, and uh, feedback given by clients to these companies. They all know that this is needed and that uh, stakeholders in the societies and clients are interested to see this. So what we could feel is PPAs are more interesting for many companies, uh, ambitious sustainable targets are at the moment a, a, a very clear asset of every industrial activity in Europe. And I can imagine the demand for renewable energy will grow faster in some of our countries in the European Union as the supply side will grow at the same time. So it is a totally different situation. And one more aspect, it is not only focused on existing industries. Uh, I'm sure uh, some of you may have heard that Tesla decided to invest in uh, an area very close to Berlin in Brandenburg in our control area. At the end, Tesla will need as much electricity as a city like Leipzig with uh, 600,000 inhabitants. Uh, so foreign direct investment is more than ever before now also focused on the question, where can I receive, where can I get a supply of uh, green energy? Like it was mentioned by Torsten, it is often not direct re-electrification. Sometimes it's based on sector coupling, it's based on power to X technologies. But it is interesting to see that in history, labor costs, for example, were extremely relevant. Uh, of course, like always, what about innovation technologies? What about innovation capitalism is relevant for decisions about foreign direct investment? And now we can feel for many companies in the digital world, but also in traditional existing industries, foreign direct investment is now linked to the resource of green energy, renewable, renewable energy in this area. And that's the reason why we as 50 Hertz decided to accelerate the energy transition process. 
And this is not only a strategy, like I mentioned it, to tackle climate change. It is at the same time a strategy to develop an industrial location here in Europe, which is attractive for more foreign direct investment, and of course, also for national direct investment in the future. A few remarks, what does it mean for us uh, uh, to sum up as a TSO? First of all, and I think that's new for us because till now we were more acting like a um, administration if interested investors came to us in a 50 hertz control area and told us, okay, we are interested in investing renewable energy. Uh, then we talk to them, of course, uh, together with the DSOs in our control area, but now we will change our strategy. We are now interested to deliver more data, to deliver more transparency to uh, potential investors in renewable energy. Uh, where is it maybe easier to invest in a solar capacity? Where is it maybe easier to invest in uh, additional uh, offshore or onshore wind capacities? Where are the grid constraints lower and where are the grid constraints higher to speed up the investment in these kind of renewable energy? And of course, we are interested in uh, more international cooperation. We are also responsible for the Baltic Sea. Uh, we just uh, commissioned this week the combined grid solution, the first worldwide hybrid interconnector, which is integrating at the same time uh, renewable energy from offshore wind farms together with our colleagues from EnergiNet in Denmark. Um, and we will need more of these international cooperation because we have a lot of countries in Europe which are short on renewable energy, like Germany, for example. But at the same time, we have countries like Denmark, like Sweden, like Norway, where we have a lot of uh, untapped potential of renewable energy, but the demand side in the home country is lower. So let's think about more international cooperation, new projects of international cooperation. Second aspect. Obviously, if we are convinced that our system will run on renewable energy mainly or totally in 2032, it is needed to develop additional expertise and know-how. Because till now, and you all know that if you are uh, uh, well informed about the TSO business, balancing energy, all these services we need to stabilize uh, the grid infrastructure to guarantee security of supply, is often linked to existing fossil power plants. And also in our control area in 50 Hertz, we have still a lot of uh, lignite coal power plants. You know, Germany has decided to phase them out, uh, but at the moment we can use them if we need it to guarantee security of supply. Now we have to develop capacities, technologies, innovations to run a system which is based 100% on renewable energy. How do we restart, for example, a system if we have a brownout situation? Balancing energy, all these things will be needed based on renewable energy. This is something which needs a lot of innovation and we have to accelerate the process of developing these kind of innovation. Third aspect, a system which is based on millions of renewable energy capacities, which will integrate millions of electric vehicles, millions of heat pumps, millions of small scale storage capacities in private households is in a situation that you will need a big support based on digital. So digitization of the TSO business is becoming more relevant in the future. And obviously a company which was for many decades focused on keep the lights on, security of supply and digital agility is a different situation and we have to change our mindset as well to hire uh, additional expertise for this project. And last comment, and, and then I will uh, sum up, uh, is we need more cooperation. I mentioned the cooperation between TSOs in Europe, and that's very working very well, uh, but we need also more cooperation with society, with stakeholders. Till now, it was not the usual case that we discuss as a TSO with our industrial clients, but now it starts. Industrial clients who were till now based with their processes on fossil energy are asking now for a grid connection. 
and we have to think about and to anticipate what will happen in the chemical industry in some areas, what will happen in the refinery industry, in the cement industry, the steel industry, and this will have an impact to the grid infrastructure planning in our countries as well, if there are big industrial clients who will need more uh, electrical industry. Hydrogen was mentioned by Thorsten Herdan earlier today, I will not talk a lot about it, but obviously combining the electrolyzer processes with the grid infrastructure and the resources of renewable energy is another aspect where we have to uh, activate the communication process with stakeholders, with politics, uh, with uh, NGOs. And that's uh, what we also have to do because, and that's the last sentence, what we need is a common uh, engagement, a common commitment of the whole society, not only politics, not only NGOs, and also not only TSOs. We need a, a clear commitment of our whole society if we want to fulfill this very ambitious target to become the first climate neutral continent as Europe at latest in 2050. Thanks for that. And now I'm very interested to listen to Manon and the colleagues about their view. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, and I think you all hear me. Um, good to see you again. And uh, you said also, um, yeah, we um, are used to keeping the lights on. And at the same time, I think we want to lighten the way ahead together. And uh, thanks also, Antonella, for bringing us uh, together uh, uh, again from RGI. Yeah, I think uh, we are heading towards an interactive dialogue and I wanted to share five things that I believe that need to happen and where Tenet also will do its part in the energy transition. And I want to start also, and, and you touched upon it too, um, Stefan, one prerequisite. And uh, I think you ended with that. And that is that political and public uh, support are essential for acceleration. I think we are in a very demanding uh, transition, uh, onshore, offshore wind, it's solar farms, new grids, heat pumps, uh, while we continue to use yet less and less uh, fossil fuels. And I think it starts to really affect uh, how we live, it starts to affect our wallets, how industry uh, operates, how cars drive, um, how energy is produced, and I think it will in the end also really uh, reshape our landscape and affect nature. Um, for me, energy transition, yeah, it's not about or not only about technology, but in the end, this is about our society. It's about how we do this uh, with respect also to uh, nature. And I think uh, we all agreed upon the Paris Agreement and, uh, and lately the 55% um, uh, target. And I think we, we know this will not be easy. And I also strongly believe, I think with you, Stefan, that we will only get there if we all get there. Five uh, things I wanted to share. I think, first of all, um, if we want to accelerate with, a more, um, uh, with more renewable energy production in the system uh, before 2030, we will need to have targets in 2021. If I only look at our offshore business, um, Tenet will invest 20 billion euro only uh, to connect 10 gigawatts in the Netherlands and 17 gigawatts offshore in, in Germany. And that will be enough for around 30 million households in, uh, in the two countries. Um, we have already st started, and I'm pretty sure, Stefan, you do the same. We have already started... Uh, uh, our 2030 projects. Uh, so for Tenet, for TSOs, uh, 2030 is tomorrow. And my COO would say 2030 is yesterday. Um, and if we need to do more, we need to know that next year to start speed up also our, uh, our planning. Um, I think we are looking on how we can accelerate uh, offshore grid planning in combination with onshore grid planning and anticipating higher targets. My second message would be around green industry politics. And you touched upon that too, uh, Stefan, that is required to offer perspective, I think, for growth, for both the renewable energy producers, as well as for our economy, uh, eco economic uh, recovery. 
And I think it sounds maybe a bit strange for some of you, but uh, for more renewable energy production, we also need more renewable uh, consumption. Uh, we are in the business of balancing supply and demand. And um, if we want to uh, um, accelerate, I think the electrification of the industry, we uh, need to make sure we give some perspective there. And I think with the COVID-19 uh, recovery funds uh, that are in place or putting in place, we have a unique opportunity um, where we invest in more electrification in the industry. And it will not only give a more sound business case uh, for the offshore wind developers, but it will also deliver economic uh, growth and jobs. And I think we can only do, do this if, um, yeah, effectively if governments, industry and grid operations uh, collaborate. And the funny thing is that I think uh, um, yeah, jobs and economic growth will, add, will, will in their return also um, uh, stimulate public and political support. So it's all, I think, hanging together. Um, Tenet 2 wants to definitely support electrification of the industry by uh, yeah, transporting offshore wind in time to energy clusters. I think thirdly, we want to work towards one gigawatt electrolyzers in 2030 and also a significant cost reduction of uh, hydrogen to facilitate in the end uh, system integration. Um, Torsten Herdan uh, uh, said already, we need electrons and molecules. Um, hydrogen has a huge potential, but we need to mature the technology towards a scale of, I would say, at least a one gigawatt and also to bring down the cost. Um, in my view, hydrogen should be produced at shore where the offshore wind lands so that from there we can transport it uh, to the industry clusters in a real good interaction with our electricity system uh, in order not to bring the cost of the system uh, at, uh, at a higher cost than, uh, than needed. Um, I think also uh, we will need hydrogen. It has a great potential for seasonal storage on days where, like today, when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not uh, shining. And I think at Tenet we have started, for example, with a new department called Energy System Planning, where we really uh, do integrated planning for electrons and molecules and where we work together with the gas uh, TSOs. Two more points before I close off. I think, fourthly, um, we have to start also exploring cross-border offshore wind projects uh, now for the mid-2030s. And I think, uh, Stefan, you mentioned uh, the Baltic area. Yeah, I think in the end, the North Sea will be Northwest Europe's powerhouse. Um, also, Tenet and, and partners, we are working uh, in uh, North Sea Wind Power Hub which is not only about uh, the electrical system, it's also about diversity, biodiversity, and about social acceptance to, to make sure we build these parks uh, also in a, uh, yeah, with nature inclusive uh, design. And I think towards 2050, and that is for TSOs, not tomorrow, but probably something like next month, we need a coordinated cross-border um, approach with standardized uh, assets and uh, assets at scale, standardized, for example, in terms of uh, high voltage levels, uh, yeah, to create an opportunity um, to, um, yeah, to connect on a European uh, level. And I think um, uh, we want to start together with the Dutch-German uh, government uh, to look into uh, synergies for society. To close off, I wanted to say that in order to accelerate the energy transition, it needs to, it means that we need to do things differently and with courage. Uh, I think there's a beautiful saying, at least in, uh, in, the, in the UK, where they say, a calm sea has never made uh, a skilled sailor. Uh, so I think uh, more also as TSOs, we need to anticipate industry demand, Stefan, as you said, we need to bet on technologies that still have to prove themselves. I think we need to uh, accelerate uh, offshore wind planning without the certainty of the demand at this point in time. I think we will need to uh, work together with a more broad range of uh, 
stakeholders than we have ever worked with uh, before. And we will have to get out of our comfort uh, zone and show some courage. Uh, I look forward to the dialogue. I can only say I am committed to that and Tenet is committed uh, too. Thanks and back to either Stefan or Antonella. Yeah, I think Antonella, I can ask Joao for his uh, comments. Joao, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Stefan, and thanks to Antonella. And I would like to, to say good morning to all of you and thank you for the invitation, the nice invitation uh, for us, Arian, to participate in, in, this, in this session. Um, I'm going to pick a couple of ideas of what people have said so far. Um, and, uh, and uh, give some, uh, some of the insights that we have from Portugal. The first one, uh, we speak about targets, we speak about the, the accelerate the renewables-based energy system. And I would raise the question um, that perhaps many people are asking, which is, uh, is this possible? And the example we have from Portugal, I would say that yes, it is, but it needs to be sustainable. And sustainability here, many, many times, it's, it's seen as only an environmental sustainability. And for us, this sustainability is much more than that. It, it is also uh, technical sustainability and economical sustainability. Starting for the technical st sustainability, I think many of you are aware that we have some uh, specific cases in Portugal where we managed to have the system uh, fully supplied by renewable sources. Back to 2016, we have four consecutive days where 100% of our national consumption was generated from renewable sources. And uh, recently, last December, December 19, we increased this, this, uh, this achievement to 131 consecutive hours fully supported by um, renewable sources. This is to say more than five days, the Portuguese system was based only on, on re renewables, uh, biomass, uh, winds and uh, hydro. Regarding the economic sustainability, which is something that it's, uh, it's a very, a very uh, expensive or a, a very uh, important topic, because um, I think we are all uh, keen to have these uh, renewable sources, but we have to be aware how much is the cost. Even for that, I think we have some recent examples that uh, renewables are becoming tremendously competitive. Um, I give you just two numbers. We had recently two uh, solar generation auctions uh, in Portugal, and we got amazing offers by these, uh, these projects. I mean, uh, in 2019, there, were a, there, there was a project that offered for the next 15 years a price of 1476 euros per megawatt hour. And this value was decreased to 11.14 euros in this recent auction done by this year. 11 euros per megawatt hour is far much more aggressive than the marginal prices of a CCGT. So uh, when people say that renewables are nice, but they are too expensive, I think this shows uh, that it's not the case. So the, the question that some of you are asking is, okay, then it's perfect. There is, uh, this is a walk in the park to move into this renewable world. No, unfortunately it, it is not. And I, there I totally share Manon's COO when, she, when he says that uh, 2030 is yesterday. And uh, uh, in what concerns uh, to uh, a TSO, I would say that one of the biggest bottlenecks, at least in Portugal, for these renewables development nowadays is the grid. And the grid uh, is there, but the grid needs to be improved. The grid needs to be uh, developed. And there we are facing something that is, it's, uh, it's a problem, it's an obstacle, it's a constraint. And uh, I totally agree with uh, Stefan's idea of cooperation and commitment uh, from the different stakeholders and from the society. Um, we did a little exercise and it shows the conclusion was kind of the obvious, which is to correlate uh, the, 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 the correlation be, to get the correlation between um, the renewables uh, capacity that was added into the Portuguese system in the last 10 years 
and the development of the grid. As a proxy, we use the transformation capacity in our substation, which is kind of a, an idea how the infrastructure needs to increase. And guess what? In the last 10 years, the correlation, the, uh, the R square, uh, it's, more, it's higher than 80%, which you may say uh, it's obvious. I mean, more renewables, more grid. That's obvious. But when we try to license projects and we try to go uh, into construction of these projects, we are facing lots of difficulties and lots of problems. We are facing uh, multiple entities that gives their opinion, sometimes contradictory. We are facing very long process and, and definitely not uh, straightforward. And we are facing somehow a lack of a, a national or regional, I would say, master plan where spatial strategical planning, more than the environmental one, uh, is, is put it in place in order for optim optimize uh, this uh, grid development. And you may ask again, um, okay, then TSOs are okay, the problem is only outside. No, here I bring in uh, the expertise and the know-how and the innovation that you have already mentioned. And I think on our side, from the TSO perspective, we need definitely also to improve. We need to improve uh, in, uh, in the way we think, we need to improve in the way we plan. Uh, we were used to plan uh, on, on the, the deterministic models approach uh, with uh, the security of supply uh, in mind, uh, with uh, the necessary redundancy of the grids in order uh, to ensure that consumers are, are never blacked out. With all this uh, explosion of renewables and with all these needs for uh, new infrastructure, um, I think that we also need to develop more sophisticated methodologies. We need to go desperately in dynamic planning uh, methodology where some risk is added. As the risk is increased, the complexity is increased, meaning that we need, we need uh, new profiles of people in, in, our, in our companies. We need to go digital. We need to censor our inf infrastructure to get stronger data analytics. We need to be, to be uh, uh, with close uh, relationship with the markets. In my perspective, the current um, marginal price based uh, wholesale markets need to be uh, assessed because if we go into renewables and, and re, with renewables, these marginal costs going down and down, this needs to be sustainable. We need to bring in uh, some price perspective for demand side response. We need uh, to price storage, which is something that is going to be uh, part of equation. So in a nutshell, and to keep on my five minutes, I think the challenges are there, they are huge, uh, and we are committed uh, to make it to make it possible, because the de the demand is there. Just to let you know, uh, we uh, envisage in Portugal uh, to go um, from the current 20 gigawatts of installed capacity uh, to 30 gigawatts of installed capacity in 2030, and these 30 gigawatts of installed capacity. 85% of this is renewable base. We are going to keep only the combined cycle power plants because we're going to shut down the coal plants uh, by next year uh, in Portugal. So the, the demand is there and we as a TSOs, we need to be there uh, to make this possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joao. And uh, we are running out of time. So I hand over to Mark. Mark, you're still on mute. I'll start again. Uh, thank you. Um, greetings from Ireland and well done Antonella in, in assembling such a panel and, and in getting your, your conference off the ground despite the constraints. I dearly had hoped I'd be in Berlin for my first visit to that beautiful city. So I'll take your invitation to come next year. Um, just stop for a moment and let's just reflect the number of coronavirus, uh, coronavirus cases globally passed 40 million in the last week. 
and atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide recently exceeded 400 parts per million. So the highest level in 800,000 years of, of the history of the world. So these are, these are extraordinary and, and strange and very, very challenging times. The great explorer Robert Swan said, the greatest threat to our planet is the belief that somebody else is going to save it. So we carry a burden and a huge burden as leaders across our sector and in the critical sector for decarbonizing society and business in that our actions or indeed the lack of such actions will ultimately define in a very real way the environment for future generations. So we carry a huge responsibility and I suggest we need to step up to the mark in terms of living up to that responsibility. Ireland, we're a small country on the periphery of Western Europe, but my goodness, I do think we punch above our weight in many domains, whether it's economics, whether it's sport, whether it's arts, etc. Last September, we in Airgrid were the TSO and the MO for the island of Ireland across two jurisdictions, because of course, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. We launched the most ambitious strategy in our history, a strategy that speaks to our government's seminal policy initiative called the Climate Action Plan. This strategy is about transitioning us from last year where 36% of all energy, all, all electricity issues, I should say, came from renewables on the Irish power system. By 2030, we have signed up to getting to 70%. So the electricity system will carry the burden and the responsibility for a new decarbonized Ireland. What 70% on average means in 2030 is we have to be able to to operate the power system at 100% renewables when that energy is available to us. I call it the holy grail for power systems, a power system that can operate all of the time at 100% when that renewable energy is available. We started our journey in July of 2018, and it was a lonely place when we started this because our ambition was not really shared by others. What really encourages me and inspires me is the fact many nations around the world, and here we are with, 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 with some of the biggest and most critical TSOs around Europe, we're all talking about the same ambition. And states across the United, uh, across the, the US, despite Donald Trump's rhetoric, are also stepping up in a very, very significant way and saying, yes, we're going for 100% and we're gonna go for it big time. Recently in Ireland, a new three-party coalition government, including the Green Party, not just reaffirmed its commitment to the Climate Action Plan, but actually said we're going to double the targeted rate of emissions reduction from what was a 3.5% reduction per annum to 7% by 2030. So I like to think Ireland, small as we may be, we are at the epicenter and we are a microcosm for the global challenge we all face. Airgrid's newly created purpose on the back of our strategy is a very simple line, and I'm so glad some of my colleagues here uh, uh, reference back that awful reductionist term the TSOs used to lean on, keep the lights on, and indeed the money flowing. Our new purpose is about transforming the power system for future generations. Small number of words, but very powerful words. Transform because it's a revolution, it's not an evolution. Secondly, the power system because it's no longer the grid. It's a very complex and holistic ecosystem right across all the different dimensions. And future generations, because it's about the obligation of my generation and yours to our children, of which I have three, and our grandchildren, of which I have two. So what are we gonna do in the next 10 years? What's our ambition? At 100% renewables, we have to do six things. Firstly, from an installed base of four and a half thousand megawatts of onshore wind main, mainly, we have to do in the next 10 years what took us 20 years before now. We have to add offshore wind, we have to add solar and more onshore wind, and we have to do another 10 megawatts in the next 10 years. We have to reinforce the grid. That means new wires, it means upgraded uh, wires, and it means technologies in wires and substations. There is no solution about wires and without new wires, and we must be honest with our stakeholders in that regard. Thirdly, we need more interconnection. We're very much an island nation. We've limited interconnection to the UK. And our flagship project to connect Ireland to France, the Celtic Interconnector, for which we're very grateful for substantial EU funding, is very much mobilised. 
and hopefully will be complete by 2026. Private sector projects, namely GreenLink, will strengthen connection between the Ireland of Ireland and the United Kingdom, notwithstanding the Brexit challenges which are in front of us. Fourthly, we need to design a power system which has technological solutions that can handle 100% renewable energy when that energy is, is, is flowing, whether it's solar or whether it's wind. Today, we're restricted to 65% on the system. That's for reasons of system stability. By mid next year, we'll be at 70. And by 2030, we'll be at 100% renewables capability in the power system. Fifthly, the market must evolve. You cannot move to 100% renewables power system without a more sophisticated market proposition which encourages and incentivizes people to deploy technology and get appropriately remunerated for providing us with technology to keep the system stable. And that will, may on occasions, put us up against regulators and indeed European ideology around market. The market will not solve all of the solutions. There has to be an element of a plan-led approach. Lastly, we will be an exemplar as a low-carbon company in how we work, how we procure, how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis, and critically, how we protect nature. In this regard, our board has approved an ambition that for every project we do, we'll have both not just maintain, but we'll enhance the natural environment and associated biodiversity wherever we find ourselves across the island of Ireland. Can I leave you with a final thought? Because I absolutely have faith in the technologists. I have absolute faith in the engineers and the infrastructure people. The biggest challenge we collectively face is getting the ordinary people in Ireland and across Europe to actually buy into this vision and to feel they have a stake in this, they want to be part of it, and they're going to get something back if they're going to accept infrastructure near their towns, near their villages, near their homes. We must be more generous, we must be more open, we must get them into the tent and win, win hearts and minds. That's our biggest challenge, folks. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about this when we get to the, pa to the panel discussion. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to the conversation that's going to ensue. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to uh, invite our last panelist uh, for this session, Werner Goetz from Transit BW. Werner. Yeah, Stefan, thank, thank you very much. And uh, Antonella, thank you for having me here. Um, well, we, we have already had l uh, learned a lot and uh, I think we, we all understand that we have a clear mission and the clear mission is to provide the infrastructure to enable the integration of renewable generation. Um, that sounds very easy. Indeed, it's, it's a huge challenge and uh, to picture that uh, this will, will require only by 2030 around 12,000 kilometers here in Germany to be renewed or newly built. And this uh, goes aligned with an investment of over 40 billion euros. Does that concern me? No, not really, because we all have the commitment to do that. And we are ready to provide the uh, innovation and the technology necessary to do that. Uh, we also are ready to provide the flexibility in changing the operational and organizational uh, conditions. So my concern in in, in uh, reality actually is how to generate the acceptance and support, not on a federal level, um, how to generate that support on a, a local level. Well, we, we do have uh, the, the perfect situation that more than 80% of the German population is supporting the Energiewende. Uh, we do have a very strong backing from the federal uh, government so you could say that's ideal conditions to, to provide uh, this change. The real ch challenge indeed is uh, the, the support on the local side. So why I'm saying that is so uh, what uh, we experience on, on the local area is that we hear sentences like, of course, we stand up for the climate change and the climate targets. Of course, we support the German Energiewende. And of course, we even acknowledge the need for the extension of the power lines, but please not here. So once it comes back to the own backyard, things change. That's, I think, one of the real challenges. 
accelerate the shift uh, which, which actually we need. So the big question is how we generate this acceptance on, on local and on the project, um, on the project. Is, is the system still working? Did I? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I think the, the, the key, um, the, the key solution there definitely is um, discussions, informations, uh, transparency in the question, what are we doing, why are we doing this, and why there is a need. Nevertheless, um, I think the, the challenge we have here is a challenge which requires uh, to join forces, and join forces uh, actually really means that we need partners to generate that, uh, that acceptance. Um, it sounds relatively easy, but uh, I think the reality is it's much more difficult because um, even for politicians, it's relatively easy to stand up for the overall climate targets and uh, to uh, find the identification for for the general topics and general uh, um, objectives. Uh, once it comes back to uh, to the local level or the project level, it's it's much harder to stand up uh, and to resist uh, against public resistance. Um, and in order to be successful there, you really need to have support. Um, and to get that support, uh, the, the fundamental um, requirement is communication. And therefore, I really um, appreciate this opportunity to exchange and to communicate, um, especially between the parties involved, the TSOs and the NGOs. And Antonella, thank you again for providing that platform and thank you uh, to provide RDI's uh, initiatives uh, to generate that communication and that dialogue. And I'm looking forward to uh, today's discussions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Werner. And then uh, thanks to all the colleagues once again. Before I hand over to Antonella, um, I, I would really um, want to highlight that we have now noticed we are uh, combined in a common target situation, that's very clear. And we have highlighted that there are many different aspects and difficulties and challenges for the future. But I think uh, we are also uh, convinced that this will be able to tackle this challenge. Antonella. Thanks a lot to all of you. Please keep your uh, video on and stay with us. We have accumulated a bit of delay, so it's all fine because that's perfectly normal. Um, we are uh, changing slightly the, the flow of the event. We will listen now to the reaction. We have um, um, Katerina, uh, this is the one slide, please move on. Um, it, it is indeed great that we have uh, such a strong commitment from all of you. I would like to remind you that uh, when we set up RGI more than 10 years ago, 11 years ago, the, no one knew what the TSOs was. You know, there were the utilities and the TSOs who were very keen in hiding themselves. And today you are all so outspoken, really uh, becoming the lighthouse of uh, this energy transition. But now we would like to hear from Caterina, Christine, sorry, Materazzi Wagner. She is the chair of the Electricity Working Group, followed by Fabian. Stich Note, this is a difficult name for me to pronounce, from Friday for the Future in Germany, and Wendel Creo from Cannes. Um, these are very different stakeholders, and all of them have very diverse uh, interest and opinion. Christine, I know that you have had some uh, challenges, uh, technological challenges. I give you the word, and if it doesn't work, then uh, we will adapt accordingly. Can you hear us? Uh, thank you, Antonella. I hear you clearly. Uh, I hope you can hear me as well. Yes, go ahead. Ah, perfect. Uh, that was a, a mess because we're, well, we have some problems to use Zoom. Anyway, so um, fantastic that it finally worked so to start with a few initial messages. Um, I think it's very important to agree on ambitious targets, but also to agree on the steps that we need to achieve them. Uh, a second comment would be that um, 
we need to estimate the impact on the grid. So we need to strengthen and to specifically the users uh, to develop their simulation skills as well as the planning tools. So it's a lot about this IT system support that is needed for a proper, um, well, uh, shaping of the future. Uh, the third point would be that uh, it would be great if all organizations involved, but especially also the TSOs, could strengthen the coordination within their organization. So between the different departments, so between system operation, network planning, uh, also the TSO market services, because we sometimes experience in discussions that we have with the TSOs, but of course also with some of the regulators. So it is also on, on our side uh, that uh, we work a bit or think a bit in silos, but we need to integrate these areas a bit more. The fourth point would be that we need to investigate alternatives and, and innovations in case that some of these initially planned steps for the implementation face barriers. So we need to, to find ways to work around. And the final point uh, is, of course, we need to build trust. And here I would like to stress that it's important that we explain the complexity of the system. So the electricity uh, system is terribly complex with, from the technical perspective, uh, from, from the market side, from system operation, and, and the, of course also um, from the interactions between the different players and the whole market design. But I'm not sure if it helps if we oversimplify. So this complexity is there and it just needs to be properly explained. And if I may go on uh, with a very brief reaction to uh, the speakers before. So Stefan Kappel uh, mentioned that more international cooperation is needed. Yes, of course, we fully agree. Uh, and uh, as base for this uh, strength and cooperation, a common understanding of the challenges and the chances is needed as an initial step. And we need to develop expertise, uh, Stefan mentioned expertise and, and know-how is needed. Yes, we, we need to develop it jointly and exchange the know-how so that we can um, take some of the, uh, well, not, not all of us have to develop it on their own, so that we take some synergies on the joint development of this newly needed know-how. And the commitment of the whole society is indeed needed. Um, and uh, he also mentioned complexity. And as I just said, it, it should be properly explained. Now, as a reaction to uh, the speech from Manon van Beek, uh, yes, collaboration is needed uh, and it's the base to develop further. Electricity is a challenge uh, and it, it requires better uh, simulation and forecast tools because it's important to have an idea on what the consequences for the system are and to have this properly in advance before deciding and before uh, setting up uh, steps to reach this uh, energy transition. And coordinated cross-border approach is crucial, of course. Um, in reaction to uh, Joao, uh, who asked, he asked if it's uh, possible in a sustainable way. And this is, of course, also a question that is very important for the regulators. We are talking here about long-term investments, uh, and so we, we need to have a sustainable uh, perspective and uh, the uh, system security level must be maintained in addition. Um, Joao also mentioned the regional master plan. The European planning is already existing. So for example, with the TIVA NDP or also the 10E regulation, uh, but it must be further developed and improved. And I may refer to uh, some ACER opinions uh, on part of the TIVA NDP process or also the uh, PCI list. As a reaction to Mark, uh, who said the strategy is important, I, I fully agree, uh, because it provides kind of a defined picture of the future. And we have to identify feasible steps towards this target. And we need to start going now, even if not all steps are completely clear. So we have to trust that solutions will be developed on the go. And uh, he also mentioned market, that not everything can be solved by the market uh, only. Uh, yes, uh, nevertheless, market is crucial. It's, uh, it's the cornerstone of, of the whole electricity system as we have it now. Um, but I tend to agree that some other measures might be needed, at least during a transition phase. And with a very brief reaction to uh, Werner Goetz, uh, who said that the TSOs are the ones to provide the infrastructure. Yes, of course, and, and that's a very important and, and crucial role. 
but from my perspective, it's not only the infrastructure, it's also the related operational system, so also the uh, optimization or optimized use of the existing infrastructure and uh, the related procedures and the related market facilitation. So it's more, uh, by far more than, uh, if, if I may say, just provide the infrastructure, it's the whole thing, the TSO provide and uh, that now needs to be developed further. So that's it from my uh, perspective and thanks a lot. Christine, thanks a lot for your very um, punctual uh, overview and addressing all the speakers. Um, I want to pass the word to Fabian, Friday for the Future. Fri uh, Fabian, it, it's really a pleasure to have you as a person here, but also as a representative of your group. Uh, we have heard Mark saying uh, the future is uh, of our kids and the kids of our kids. Um, and we have heard Werner saying uh, the local opposition is very strong and we cannot do the work we need to. But also everyone uh, fully committed to engaging with people and really deliver uh, what society wants. So Fabian, what is your opinion of this discussion? Yes, thank you Antonella. I hope you can all hear me now loud and clearly. Perfect. So yeah, as, as you already said, I'm Fabian from Fight for Future Germany. We are a youth movement. Yes, fighting... Sorry? Okay. We're, we're youth... Thank you. <laughs> we're a youth movement uh, fighting for climate justice, fighting for the 1.5 degree target, and therefore for Germany to reach carbon neutrality by 2035. Um, as we already heard today, it's important that, si that society gets behind the um, reduction targets, behind the energy transition, and therefore I'm happy to be part of the event today and hope that it can be a real start to, to real change. So um, when talking about that, I'm, I also see the um, having 100% renewable energies by 2032 statement by 50 Hertz as an important start. Um, because to make a, for, a fair contribution to the 1.5 degree target, Germany must phase out coal energy by 2030. Fossil energies must be replaced by renewable energies and projects like the ones presented here today show us that this will work. But we must not forget that there are only 15 years left until 2035. Only 15 years, that's like a really short uh, period. We no longer have time for the electric pilot project. We must now tackle the big picture. And if, as today, Manon van Beck says that 2030 is tomorrow, then we have to be carbon neutral by the day after tomorrow. And to reach that, we need to do the, the calculation with the right numbers uh, already today. So these presented projects can and have to be a start of changes which are long overdue and which due to the amount of time we've let go by not acting have to come at a speed rate that is really hard to imagine and that at the moment no one really is talking about. To get a better understanding of the actions and the speed rate that we need, us, Price for Future, recently, I think it was, it was last week, uh, Tuesday, published a scientific study together with the Wellnon Wuppertal Institute um, and for those of you who did not see the study yet, I highly recommend uh, looking at it. And secondly, what I can already tell is that the study shows that reaching carbon neutrality 2035 in Germany will be extremely hard. But the study once again shows that carbon neutrality 2035 is needed to reach the Paris Agreement and that all plans that, we, that are currently discussed are not enough to reach the 1.5 degree goal. The current, the current political reduction goals are not enough. And therefore, it makes no sense to me that Mr. Uh, Herdan is talking about German leadership in fighting the climate crisis, while science is saying that all our goals will miss the Paris Agreement by far. And I don't understand how anybody can call this inspiring. Please stop advertising carbon, neutral carbon neutrality 2050 for Germany and re Europe as it is enough and start listening to the science. So, to continue, also most of the studies that we discussed are not enough, and therefore the scenarios that could develop and plans are based on are not enough. And of course, also the European reduction targets, even those that have been so strongly celebrated by the parliament recently, are not enough. And it should be stopped, once again, to advertise them as so. 
our study shows, for example, that we need to build a minimum of 30 gigawatts of renewable energies per year, while the German government is currently talking about less than 10 gigawatts per year. So there's already, we, we can see a huge, a huge difference. 30 gigawatts per year is a lot, and at 50 hertz wants to reach 100% renewables by 2032 in a just way. And if you want us to be satisfied by that, you need to plan with those numbers. The study also shows that we immediately need to start to reduce emissions in the industrial sector, in the mobility sector, and in all, in all other sectors as well. We need to bring down the curtain on fossil fuels immediately and use renewable energies. This is also something that needs to be taken into account when talking about 100% renewable energies. So, to sum it up, the conclusion of the study is once again that it will be extremely hard to reach carbon neutrality by 2035, but the study also shows that it is possible. It is possible from a technical perspective and from an economical perspective. The only question is, do we want to reach it? And as you might know, our answer is yes, we want to reach it, and that is why we published the study as a first step. Now, this study must be a starting point for Germany and for all of Europe. From this starting point on, we must conduct more re research Players across all fields must start acting and must start moving into the right directions everywhere they can. Car neutrality is, of course, not reached passively. It is reached by focusing on it in every sector and on every level there is. And as much as I hope that our study will be a start, I, of course, hope that 50 Hertz 100 renewables by 2032 statement will be a start too. Because to a real start means that there's much more to follow, and we, def and we definitely need that. Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm sorry. Is my, is my time already up? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Fabian. Um, I will pass the word soon in a moment to Wendel. Clearly, uh, what you are depicting here is how everyone is failing, you as a young generation. Uh, and I want everyone uh, to reflect on this before you are given the possibility to respond to the respondents, but first, Wendel. Thank you, Antonella, and thank you, RGI, for inviting us to be part of this. So maybe one word about Can Europe. We are a federation of over 170 NGOs in Europe that work on climate change and uh, climate change policies in, in Europe and in the, uh, in the member states. Um, for me, it's important, and a few of the speakers, and of course, Fabian also highlighted uh, why are we uh, having this discussion. We're having this discussion in part because climate change is impacting um, our lives and is having serious impacts, not only somewhere far away, not only on human lives and on the environment, but also on our economic system and including on our um, energy system. And so it's good to think about how do we how do we prevent that? And we know that to avoid the most dangerous forms of climate change, our governments have agreed um, on a limit um, to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Uh, by the end of the century. Um, and that's what they have uh, set into the Paris Agreement. As NGOs, we've looked into what does this mean? What does um, the commitment um, to 1.5 mean for the European energy system? And we have developed um, with our network and with scientific advisors, etc., our own scenario. It's called the Paris um, agreement compatible scenario for the energy transformation of the, uh, of the European Union. And in that, it's clear that we need to reach 100% renewable energy by 2040, which means that we need to triple um, uh, renewable energy generation um, in the coming decades um, while achieving um, close to 100% renewable electricity by 2030. So that's a very, very challenging um, uh, <clears throat> a very challenging scenario and one that, uh, that we need to work together on if you want to achieve that. Um, of course, this challenge um, is, is not only a challenge, as I said, it will help us to avoid costs of growing impacts of climate change. Um, several of the TSOs have said that actually investments in renewables has already proven to be cheaper in many uh, circumstances as compared to investments in, in the traditional uh, fossil fuel based um, industries. And it also has other uh, benefits, including uh, provision of more jobs, uh, more health for people, and so on and so on. 
it is good to see um, TSOs engaging in this. It's good to see that um, the business sector recognize that change is needed. That is not the case everywhere, but it's good to see um, uh, certain TSOs taking a lead on this. Um, of course, more will be needed, and I have uh, three, three main items that I wanted to raise based on the different interventions. One is the issue of planning. And we heard several um, <clears throat> several uh, commitments that different TSOs have made with regard to 2030 or with regard to 100% renewables. I think it will be crucial that, um, for the moment, given the failure of the TYNDPs, the 10-year network development plans, to um, adopt a 100% renewable scenario, that at least individual TSOs adopt 100% renewable plans and targets for their own work. I think that will be a crucial issue to uh, ensure we move forward. Uh, secondly, um, a lot has been said, I mean, infrastructure is a crucial element if you want to get to 100% renewables. But this is not only about increasing interconnections between countries, it's actually also about adapting our infrastructure to how a future um, energy system could look like with much a much bigger importance of uh, prosumers, a bigger importance of energy com consumers and so on. So it's also looking at how do we decentralize our infrastructure system so that it's ad adapted um, to how the future uh, will look like. And, and that's something I didn't hear um, mentioned uh, much. And third issue is as um, getting into a 100% renewables energy system needs uh, interconnections in Europe not necessarily outside, because we believe that the EU has the capacity to produce 100% renewables domestically, but it needs interconnections. And so the question is, how do you as um, TSOs that take some kind of a vanguard position in this uh, debate will ensure that all the others also come on board? Thanks. Thank you very much, Wendel. So, um... I, I'm trying to facilitate now the conversation. I know that Joao has to leave, so I would like to give uh, first Joao uh, the possibility to uh, respond quickly to these three comments and, uh, um, and then also some closing remarks from your side before we uh, try to have a conversation with the other um, participants in this panel. Thanks, Antonella, and I apologize, but I'm, I'm really running out of time. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, with, uh, I thank for this, this, uh, these inputs that have been given, starting with, uh, with uh, uh, Fabian inputs. I, I do not know in detail the, the reality of, uh, of uh, the German system, but I understand that, uh, that uh, your worries about uh, a necessary push towards uh, an aggressive uh, move into renewables. I would tend to say that I think that everyone is trying to do that. Um, we are trying to balance, as I try to say, uh, the different uh, levers, uh, not only the environmental, and, but also the technical and the economical one. Uh, I think the response is being given by the different stakeholders. Of course, there are still obstacles. Of course, there are still uh, issues to be solved. But um, I think we, that we are trying uh, to go on that direction. And um, if you allow me to, to, to question a little bit is, is the fact that uh, 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 targets, I think, are very important um, in order for us to go into this, to this direction. But in my perspective, is that the targets uh, that were set uh, Europe-wise uh, 10 years ago, I think they, 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 uh, they were very important and they got results because uh, uh, as it was said, I don't know exactly uh, who said that, but it's not only the utility, it's not only the TSOs, it, it's the overall uh, society that has engaged in this direction. Of course, there are parts of this society that would like us to go faster. There are others that would like us to go, to go slower, but there is, is the equilibrium we have to face. Regarding the comments of uh, Wendell, I think that you have a good point in, in mentioning the prosumers. And I think that um, 
in my personal view, uh, the biggest change on, on this huge uh, uh, evolution of, of the energy system is the fact that uh, uh, the, the value chain is no longer a line that goes from uh, uh, generators, uh, transmission, distribution, suppliers, consumers, but, but I think that you have to, to give a picture I would use circles and I would put the consumer in the center of the circle for several reasons. Be because first, technically, they are becoming, as you, as you mentioned, prosumers. They not, do not only consume, but they are generators. And we have plenty of examples of that here in Portugal. Just to, for you to, to know, for instance, we are moving into our ancillary services in our dispatch center. Now it can be provided by big industrial consumers, which was something that if you would say uh, 10 years ago, everyone would, would tell you that it would be impossible. This is actually happening. Ancillary service is no longer being given only by the traditional entities like utilities and generators. Well, I, I want to stop you because you said you are running and now you are staying with us. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yes, well, so, so I, I totally agree that consumers are the center and all the other entities need to uh, respond to, to, this, uh, to this center. The challenges are there, as I, I, I told, but I think that we are on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joao. And uh, I would like to give the, um, the word one by one to all the others that are in this panel. And thanks a lot for uh, staying with us. Uh, there is uh, um, one uh, um, big question that is coming out from the pool everywhere. Uh, I want to read it to you because while you respond to the challenges that have been posed by our three respondents, um, you um, kindly also should address this question. Uh, all, all, all of you refer to the importance of public acceptance. Uh, I must say that Werner was also very critical in saying there is no local support. So you want something, but then you don't want, really want it. So where, can you pick one very concrete measure on how to increase support? Uh, what would you like to see happening? So, um, Experiences are very different, but clearly, the, if we want to see a net zero, we need everyone. Citizen, industry, TSOs, NGOs, we need everyone to walk the line. Um, so I would like to start with, uh, now with Werner, because he was the last to speak out of the round. And uh, mm, it is late, uh, but Werner, please. Yep. Uh, your you. reaction um, and your thoughts. Yeah, I'll try to respond directly to your question. What's your uh, first point on the wish list? Um, yes, I, I really experienced that the local acceptance is one of the major hurdles. And uh, if, if I would uh, draft the critical path why are, and answer the question, why are we delayed in so many projects? It's because um, people on the local side do not uh, accept the changes necessary. And uh, what's required to get the, there um, is definitely uh, to join forces um, on a local area. And join forces means join forces between the, the TSOs as, as the project responsible uh, institution, together with uh, local politicians, together with the NGOs on the local side. And that also means to fight for um, the changes necessary on a project level. So what we see right now is that we have a, a, a strong discussion, which I think is necessary with regard to overall targets, uh, with re regard to overall acceptance for the um, change on a, on, on a high level uh, area. But we also need to accept the fact that this requires changes on the local area. And we do have uh, resistance on power line projects, on wind projects, on even now here in Kupferzell on, on this fancy idea of a net booster concept, which actually is a battery, we, we have strong public resistance. And um, we are alone. So, so there is no politician standing up uh, supporting us on the local side. There is no NGO standing up uh, local, uh, protecting and, and, and working um, 
on the project level. So that would be my wish, help us on the project uh, at the local level. Uh, Verna, this is uh, very important and uh, I can tell you that uh, we will really try to uh, set up uh, some webinars, some conversation like this in more restricted together with the NGOs but also with Pride of the Future and Extinction Rebellion to see what can be done together because we need to walk uh, this path together. Yeah. Just if, to if I close with a quote of Stefan, Stefan once said uh, in Germany we have the situation that the kids are fighting for our future and for the climate targets on Fridays and on the weekends we, we, we see mama and papa fighting for or against uh, power lines and, and wind farms and that's that's the reality. Um, thanks a lot uh, Stefan so we stay in Germany and uh, I pass the word to you. Um, you announced this 100% uh, uh, by 2032 you see that uh, actually Ireland is doing the same and uh, um, Portugal is the very similar ambition, so you are not alone. Um, how can you learn from each other and how can we really concentrate on the potentials, as Wendell said, that Europe has before we look to Chile, uh, that was mentioned three times by Thorsten this morning? Yeah, of course, Antonella. Wendell said we have the domestic potential to realize this story. And I fully agree as long as we talk about direct re-electrification, when we talk about hydrogen and the need of renewable energy for green hydrogen, maybe situation is a little bit different. But as long as we discuss the topic of direct re-electrification, we have the European potential, but that's extremely important. It is a European potential. Fabian, was mentioning the situation, how, how high is the demand side situation for renewable energy in Germany? And it will increase further by e-mobility, by industrial processes, by uh, heat pumps. Um, so it is from my perspective, uh, not realistic that we will fulfill this demand side only by German potential of renewable energy. It will only work with, like Manun was mentioning it, uh, North Sea, uh, projects between different European countries like uh, we have it in the Baltic Sea as well. Uh, that's the reason why the interconnections are so relevant. One comment, uh, additional comment about the uh, question of public acceptance. What I'm really uh, disappointed about is uh, what, what uh, Werner was mentioning, uh, uh, political support. And not only political support when there is criticism and claiming and all these things. That's totally normal and we are a free society so people uh, should have the right to to go to the court if they feel they have uh, some disadvantages but what we can also see we see that political decisions are very ambitious when we talk about uh, targets of tackling climate change and then the same politicians are going back to their home countries and and tell us okay but this area is difficult because we need it for submarine or well, this area is difficult because there is a port and we need this way for the ships going into this port. Or well, this area is, is postponed because we need more time to make some archeological studies before we can allow that you invest in grid infrastructure. This will not work. If climate, tackling climate change is the number one priority, other political areas have to step back and to say, okay, uh, and I do not talk about nature protection, uh, uh, bird protection and things like that. I, I really talk about things like archaeology and other things, other infrastructures. And, and that's what I'm really a little bit disappointed about. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so I understand well that you said that, of course, we do nature protection, but we also need to utilize space uh, among other users in a reasonable way. Uh, we do have a, a working group in the afternoon about this, so it's uh, well done, uh, well planned. Um, Manon, you are already in between you know, Germany and the Netherlands, so I want to keep this geography, geographical round. Uh, you know both countries. Um, I think also the Netherlands has been leading in many, many aspects and very innovative approaches has been developed. Um, 
and there is a very strong commitment to full decarbonization. Um, what is your response and what are your um, main uh, um, yeah, point that you take with you out of this? Yeah, thanks Antonella. And thanks also Christine and Fabian and w Wendell for sharing your uh, feedback. Yeah, I think the challenges are huge and, and the ambition is high and maybe even higher in the next uh, year. And uh, I, what I take with me from uh, your feedback is, you know, um, so it's complex. Sometimes uh, society people don't understand, but it's our role to then explain it better uh, in a simple, but I think also not simplistic, uh, uh, simplistic way. Um, I think, uh, Fabian, you said, you know, we need to use more facts and science, and I fully agree, including scenarios from 2050 back to 2020. Uh, we need pilots at scale, and um, we need also to speak up when things are not possible, and not because we are not ambitious, but because we are ambitious. And I think one thing that I say in Tenet often is that we need to be daring, yeah, daring to be unpopular as a kind of... Uh, and it's not because we are not ambitious, but because we need to speak up because we are the ones who overview the system. And I think we have an obligation to speak up and to speak uh, out. And I think what I also take away, we have to include all of you. And I think maybe Fabian to you in particular, you can be assured, I think that we as TSOs and, and also myself from Mondays to Fridays, I work for the future uh, like you. Um, I think on, on the topic of acceptance, uh, yeah, I, I agree also with what Stefan was saying, is that, um, um, yeah, we need political support uh, on all the levels. That is a bit different in the Netherlands. Well, we are maybe a small country, but I think we don't have the things that are said in Berlin or in the Netherlands, in The Hague, you know, are also resonated in all the provinces. Uh, so these different opinions, we don't really see that. Um, I think as TSOs, we are there in the front line with people demonstrating or even threatening our people in the field. That is actually what is sometimes happening. And it's really, we need the support, the political support, NGO support, also out there in the field every single day uh, to get it done. And so not only in the capital cities, but out there in the field while constructing. Great. Mark. Hi, so I'm going to be a tiny bit provocative, okay, just just for the fun of it, because I think it's important. Um, I, three points to make. Number one, can we stop, um, look, stop making excuses? The technology is there, or it's coming, and we've nothing to worry about. There is no question about our engineering capacity to deliver a 100% renewable power system by 2030. We put a man on the moon, 60 years ago when I was a young child um, with awful technology that my children laugh at. So let's stop using arguments like technology or complexity, which I've heard a couple of times today, or regulation or markets. My goodness, it's well within our collective brain power and intellectual capacity to fix this. So can we, we need to get to a point where we stop creating artificial roadblocks, number one. Number two, we're in the education business. If you didn't see it, look at it tonight. David Attenborough's My Witness Statement, um, 90 Minutes on Netflix. We just need to get, as leaders, into the education space and getting our ecosystem to see us as advocates and educators, not debating or arguing around market or technology matters, which will get resolved. We have to front up and educate people because if people come on the journey, then we'll get there. Our biggest problem is if people go against us and if we start fighting amongst ourselves. And thirdly, and my last point is we're not competing with each other. We have this extraordinary collaborative proposition open to us where all of my intellectual property, all of my capability, I can share with everybody in this room and beyond and put it to work to a common solution. So I, I think, you know, we can't be making excuses. We've got to educate. We've got to deploy the technology and trust it and just get on with it and stop the kind of meandering conversations and say, 
This is an absolute global imperative and either we're up for it and we're going to go after it big time or we're just going to keep talking about it. So, so that's my, my final pitch. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I want to thank all of you and I would like to leave you with some words that are sticking out of my mind. What is this leadership into full decarbonization, net zero, climate protection, environmental protection and people? Um, we need to work together. So this collaborative and collective is a resource that we need to tap better and maybe uh, we have not done enough up to now. Um, I think the European dimension is clear. All of you have been talking about interconnections. Uh, Fabian was talking about the study in Germany. I've been uh, uh, always mentioning that Germany is only a little garden if you look at the world. So we need to understand how we can support each other without uh, forgetting that uh, the local realities are very, very important. We need to understand how to develop uh, uh, local benefits because as Mark said, we need to give more out. We need to be more generous. Um, and so if you are um, courageous, as Manon said, enough to accept not only that you may fail, but that it's difficult to explain the system as uh, uh, it has been mentioned, uh, but we need to explain it. We need the courage to prove uh, that some uh, steps are successful, some others are not. Um, next week we do the award for good practices of the year award, and many of you have been participating. And since years I've been asking to do the, the, the award for the least successful practice because we need to learn from mistakes, not only from the good things. Um, and education. Education, I think it's uh, one of the biggest achievements of uh, democratic societies. Uh, everyone should be an educator, everyone should be a leader and take everyone on board. Um, special thanks to Fabian for being in this round. I think we need to organize more of this conversation mm, and we will try um, digital options to make it easier for all of you to dedicate a couple of hours and we will try to, uh, to propose this uh, to all of you. Uh, Wendel, thanks a lot for your leadership in the NGO community. And you have heard that uh, we need your support um, more than ever, because it's a long way and we can, no one can be alone fighting for uh, climate neutrality. Um, so big thank you to all the speakers. And I'm now going to introduce the, what is happening in the afternoon session. Please be in touch, don't run away. Um, and after the break, uh, we will have um, um, breakout groups. So you know that uh, we have been touching a lot of uh, different uh, topics and uh, the devil is always in the details. So why we can have big statements on what needs to be done, but then we need teams to work on things, on real solutions. And so in the afternoon session, we are going to have six working groups. The first one is on electrification with Professor Ronnie Bellman as the moderator and input speakers, where we want to discuss what is a European electrification roadmap because um, having a roadmap for electrification will also clarify what are the next, uh, the, the other uh, um, things that have to happen. The second working group is on spatial planning. Um, space is becoming limited more and more in Europe. Uh, we need to take care of multiple interests. So what is the role of special planning and how do we combine interest in one single plan long term to make sure that we do not forget anyone. The third one is on flexibility. And we have a fantastic group with the TSOs looking at flexibility from their side, but also the demand side. It has been mentioned by many speakers, the need to involve 
a large number of stakeholders, TSOs talking to industry and large users. So we have Google on the demand side that will also share how they see uh, flexibility from their perspective. The fourth group is on gas. Um, from this morning, we have heard about the role of molecules. We can discuss endlessly how much molecule we need or we don't need. But essentially, today, today we need to have the courage to identify where molecules are needed and prepare pathways to deliver them. And here we have NSOG. Uh, the umbrella organization for the uh, gas TSOs and the uh, Amprion um, uh, from so, Gerard Kendra from Amprion, sorry. Um, the fifth working group is on offshore. Uh, offshore is uh, becoming increasingly uh, relevant. It's an important piece to achieve the climate targets and the um, increasing shares of renewables at the European level. We need to look at offshore in a very integrated manner and Ariel Brunner will lead uh, this conversation. Uh, and finally, breakout group six, it's on circular economy um, because of course circularity probably is the new uh, mantra and uh, Stefan Singer from Cannes International will lead this uh, working group. Um, if you have not yet registered for the working group, please do it now by sending an email to stephanie at renewablesgrid.eu. Um, before we um, let you off for a break, I want to tell you that we will reconvene at three o'clock. And now we have some videos to play for you. You can leave the link on the this uh, um, meeting room is already uh, is going to stay as it is until we reconvene for the working group. Um, and now I thank 